How are we all doing today? Good. Good. I'm going to invite all of you to turn with me to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19. I'm going to read the majority of this chapter. It's not a super long chapter. Um, 1 Kings, chapter 19. I'm going to begin in the first verse. I'm going to be reading from the Open Bible. That's the New King James. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. If you're there, please say amen. Amen. Good. 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning at the first verse, the Word of God says this, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life, and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. This is talking about the prophet Elijah. A day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. That's a juniper tree in other translations. And he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then he said, talking about God, God said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake. Yeah, after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return your way, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint uh, Hazel as king over Syria. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel, Mehola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel of Hazel, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. 
if you have been reading, if you have never read the Bible at any point in your life and you, you are in a place, let's say you're reading from Genesis to Revelation, literally from the beginning to the end, and you're not at this point in the Bible yet, and somebody tells you that at some point there's going to come a time in Israel where the government, the king of Israel, is who does not worship God, is going to try to kill God's prophet. If you heard about this before becoming familiar with the idolatry that Israel would pursue uh, throughout the, this book, you would think to yourself, how exactly did that happen? Because this is literally the country that God personally established. Right. These are the people whose ancestors God made a personal covenant with. The first commandment uh, that he gave to them being, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. The book of uh, Kings is, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't have that much time to really talk about it. It's a, it's, a, it's a big thing to talk about. Christina has kind of talked about this already, how originally First and Second Kings was originally one book simply called Kings. And uh, I don't want to waste your time in getting into the whole uh, different divisions that different church groups have of these books, these historical books. But as it stands, First and Second Kings is simply divided today. Like a few other books in the Bible, we had this same dilemma with Job. We ultimately don't really know the author of it. Uh, Jeremiah has been a strong uh, candidate that many scholars have discussed because at the end of Second Kings, uh, if, I, if I remember it correctly, is whenever uh, we get into the Babylonian captivity, and for, for someone who was involved with the Babylonian captivity, there would have served the purpose of going back through Israel's history and validating to the Jewish people who had been taken into captivity exactly why they were there to begin with. The issue of idolatry and spiritual fornication from Yahweh was generational at that point. Yeah. Uh, what had happened and uh, was, I'll just... I'll just go here. First Kings opens up with the death of David. And already there is this kind of grief in the air, whatever you read about that. Israel's greatest king has died. The only king that will be greater than David for Israel will be Jesus Christ when he returns. King David, who despite his obvious sin, is still considered a man after God's own heart, is dead. That is the opening of 1 Kings. After David dies, his son Solomon uh, sends to the throne in Israel. And Solomon is a pretty good king. I mean, he's not, uh, he's not just the worst case scenario. Uh, politically, he does a great job. He is immeasurable in terms of wisdom and wealth. He gets to oversee the completion of the temple of God. I mean, it's, it's incredible all that happened in Solomon's life. But Solomon would indulge in um in um oh, i forgot the word for it uh 1000 concubines over 1000 concubines um uh, what's the word for that thank you polygamy that's not a good thing i don't know why i'm smiling he would indulge in polygamy something that was not supposed to happen that he was never, ever supposed to do. In this specific act of polygamy, though, Solomon would begin to welcome different women uh, of different religions who worshipped foreign gods, something that the Lord was very clear to warn Israel about. And the repercussions for this would affect Israel for generations. Uh, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, after Solomon died, would ascend to the throne. And this other guy, Jeroboam, would come back after some time of exile. And long story short, this is where the divide in Israel happens. Jeroboam seeks after foreign gods and basically claims the, what we now have as the northern kingdom of Israel. None of their kings ever served God ever since the nation divided. Judah had some kings who would serve God, but even by Judah's standards, both of these kingdoms would not be foreign to pagan idolatry. And 
Although the book of Kings is one big history lesson about the dangers of spiritual fornication in terms of idolatry, in this case, what we're talking about, one king in particular, uh, about 60 years, if I have the dates right, after the kingdom split in half, Judah, and again, this is if I have the dates correct, Judah would have a pretty decent king, Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, I mean, he's not the best that there has ever been. He has faults. He has compromises that the scripture tells us about. But when it came down to it, I mean, his story is one of the most inspiring in the Bible. The whole issue with three armies surrounding Judah and this man, the king, the king, the king of Judah, not preparing his weapons in some great uh, glorious pride uh, fest or whatever you would call it. He instead calls it. He instead calls the nation into fast. A man who knows his weaknesses, to say the least, who knows his limitations, who knows that it is, it, it is in his best interest to give the battles that he cannot fight to God. Right. This man, though, if you can see past the faults that he would commit in his reign as king over Judah, was pretty ideal on a spiritual basis. This is not a luxury that the northern kingdom would have had at this time. Actually... One of the worst kings and one of the most evil kings in Israel's history, Ahab, was in power during this time. Ahab would marry Jezebel, um, a foreign woman who worshipped a foreign god. And the influence that Jezebel would have on Ahab would lead to the death of many who worshipped Yahweh, in particular the prophets. Uh, Jezebel had managed to manipulate Ahab into making Baal, uh, in essence, the god of the northern kingdom of Israel for their time. And when it came down to it, whenever Jezebel would learn that not everybody wanted to worship Baal, there were still some who were worshiping Yahweh, she would uh, make a little decree of her own that those who did not worship Baal were going to be put to death. Now, the interesting thing about Baal is that I suppose according to whatever Jezebel's uh, pagan religion was, is that Baal for her was attributed as a god of the rain. So God sends a prophet out of nowhere named Elijah, whose name literally means the Lord is God, to proclaim until I say so, there will be no rain in this country. Because this country cannot belong to Baal, in essence, is what is being said in this encounter. And this happens a few chapters before what we're reading. Um, Jezebel, greatly insulted by this, says, kill that man. (laughs) So the Lord has Elijah hide from Jezebel for some time. And how long can it take for a prophet to not talk about rain? Uh, Apparently three years, because for three years there is drought drought no water whatsoever and then eventually after three years and this is all just summing it up in a nutshell the lord calls elijah to go back and confront uh, ahab ahab receives word that elijah is near and oh my gosh the encounter that is recorded in i believe it's the 17th chapter perhaps uh let's see i think it's the 18th chapter Uh, which is one of the highlights of preaching. At some point, the showdown at at Mount Carmel is every preacher's favorite thing to preach about because it's incredible. And the whole build-up to it, the way that you can tell the Lord instructed and has appointed this whole thing to be organized and presented to the reader today, I mean, it's almost like the Lord wants you to be excited for what you're about to read. The way everything that happens beforehand, there's this just this desert wasteland that I that comes to my mind. And Ahab is riding out to meet Elijah on his horse, and he finds Elijah. And Ahab says from his horse, uh, and I paraphrase, so you are the one troubling Israel. I mean, it's so epic. It reminds me of like some spaghetti western from the 1960s. And Brother Larson is probably thinking, yeah, I'm sure it does. But you you know what i love movies and uh it's just incredible but past the theatrics of all of it the showdown at mount carmel one of the most epic displays of faith in the bible from one of god's people some have gone out of their way to call this the battle of the gods that's how significant that passage of scripture the events that happened in chapter 18 are to so many christians uh, elijah challenges ahab 
to meet them at to meet him to gather all of the prophets of Baal, not half or a fraction, every last prophet of Baal that is in the northern kingdom right now, and to meet him at Mount Carmel. And the thing about Mount Carmel is that if I understand correctly, is Mount Carmel was basically almost Bell's resting place, Bell's spiritual headquarters, apparently. This was, as some believe, Bell's favorite place, I guess. Uh, Mount Carmel was the place of Bell. Elijah says to Ahab, meet me there, bring all of the prophets, and bring a lot of the Israelites. 450 prophets of Bell show up. And but you all know the story. It's a very well-known story. They prepare two altars. The challenge that Elijah initiates is that whoever's, whoever's God answers by fire, he is God. So the prophets of Baal uh, go to extreme lengths to try to summon their God. They dance frank, frantically around their altar. They cut themselves. I mean, these people become so desperate to garner a reaction from Baal, a reaction that never comes. Elijah simply prays, and the Lord sends fire from heaven to strike his offering, and in doing so has convinced not just himself, which he already knew this, but everybody that the Lord is God after all. And after this little showdown, as some have called it, what happens is that Elijah has the prophets of Baal gathered together and they're executed. So Ahab goes back to Israel and he tells Jezebel what just happened. Jezebel says, um, you know, we hear a lot of people throughout the Old Testament say, as the Lord lives. Basically, her own personal version of as my God lives, Elijah is going to have to be dead by tomorrow. Mm -hmm. This man has got to die. Elijah receives word of this and he flees. Fear overtakes him and he runs away. Whereas the first time he had to hide, it was an instruction from God personally to hide from Ahab and Jezebel. He didn't receive an instruction this time. He did this on his own volition, overcome with fear. Ahab and Jezebel are out to kill Elijah right now. Mainly these two people. And when I was, re when I was studying this last night, I just thought to myself, you know, it's, probably, it's interesting to think how the modern church, a lot of people in it would probably think about Elijah's decision right now. If he did something like this, oh, you mean to tell me that you just believed God over 450 people, now you can't believe him over two? And we kind of have this idea where we just kind of submerse, immerse Elijah's condition into just a glorified place of self-pity. And self-pity does play a role in what Elijah is doing right now, but there's just more to it than that. Israel is not what it used to be. Right. This is not the kingdom that God established. If you were to look at the politics and the religion of the northern kingdom, Yahweh was, I mean, you would think that Yahweh was nowhere in sight. And here I am, Elijah, first person, the prophet of God, being faithful to God, following God's call on my life, doing what God wants me to do, saying what God wants me to say. And this is the second time that I've had to hide from the king of the nation. It's, it, it, is, it is a pure nightmare to be living through. Uh, everything that Israel had heard God say to them, don't do that, they ended up doing that. And now, whereas the prophets of God used to be of such great uh, popularity and significance to the Jewish people, now they were target number one, enemy number one, according to the king and the queen. So that brings us to our current text. Um, the first point that I want to make in this message is that trials and tribulations are real. Trials and tribulations are real. Uh, don't be surprised when they come. It's not as though, and we're not alien to this line of thinking that, you know, it's not like there are no trials or tribulations in Christian living. 
Christianity is full of trials and tribulations. We know by now that trials and tribulations in the Christian life are just as real as God himself, really. There's that verse in Isaiah that we quote a lot, Isaiah 40 or 41, 17, the first part of it, at least, that we love to say, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And it's true. It's in the Bible. It's true. But it says that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. It doesn't say to me that there will never be a weapon to form All against right. me. But the enemy of my soul will send weapon after weapon, and weapons can be deceit, it could be temptation, it could be whatever you want to make it, it could be demonic influence over the leaders of the country that I live in. God never said that there would never be a weapon formed against me. And I feel like time in Bible college has taught us that very well. We're not having, I mean, it's not like Joe Biden is out to kill the Christians. We don't have to deal exactly with what Elijah is dealing with right now. But we have a more dangerous adversary than who could, whoever could be the king and queen of Israel, whoever could be the president of the United States. The devil himself is out for your soul. Right. He is out for my soul. And time in Bible college, I mean, I'm looking at a room full of seniors right now. We have been here at least since 2018. Throughout that time, we have gone through the pandemic. We've gone through so many things that just ideally, you know, you did not come to Bible college for. We've been in one huge transitional process. This is the last Bible-only class. I mean, and even then, not all of us are in the Bible-only program. I think it's just me and Ron, to be honest. We are literally the last Bible-only students at this Bible college. It's kind of the end of an era. It's one big transitional process while going through one big pandemic and then some. The personal struggles that I've had to hear that all of you have had to go through or at least assume that you all have had to go through for one reason or another. Brother Ron, your health and your health issues. Christina being the RA, there's no telling what that entails. Milani, Brian, the things that we have all gone through in private, many of which that we just don't talk about. I mean, and it's... Uh, it's, 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 it's the last week, so I guess I can bring it up. But whenever somebody that God has used to teach you the Bible forsakes their faith, right. there are some questions that come to mind whenever that happens. Right. It is actually alien to us at this point, this fairy tale idea that there are no trials and tribulations when living for God. But trials and tribulations are not the end of it. Um, We have a great adversary, but we have an even greater advocate between us and the Father. He that is in us is still greater than he that is in the world. And the fact that all of us are still at Bible college is very much at least partial evidence of that. The number of people that I've seen come through here and leave on their own agenda because they don't like it or they think that it's just too much on them and these people who that I think about who a lot of whom don't really live for God now and it's troubling to think about and then I look at people here who have stood through the tests of faith many tests of faith some of us and it's evidence that Jesus Christ makes it all worth it the weapons of the enemy even though they will come According to what the Bible teaches me, they will not prosper. They will not prosper against me. Second point I want to make, and oh man, I forgot to give you the title. I'm sorry. Title is uh, God is there to feed me. God is there to feed me is the title. Sorry about that. But, um, The second point I want to make is that you and I are called by God for his purposes and his glory. You and I are called by God for his purposes and his glory. Elijah's life as presented to us is totally in the context of God's purpose He is a man who is just about always, I mean, obviously, with the exception of this text that we're reading right now, this is a man who has a reputation, has garnered a reputation in history as one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament era. The things, the great measure of faith that he had is just unmatched. Even for many Christians today, I would say, 
a man who could face down the king of Israel and then face down over 400 false prophets, knowing full well that God would come through for him. And yet in this text, we see that just like us, he's not a superhero. Uh, He is a man. He is a man who has emotions. He is a man who thinks like men do. And whenever things get too much for him, his inclination is to flee, to be alone in a place of what really what we would call this to be if he's begging God to take his life from him, a major depressive episode. Um, Elijah is a man, but God knows how to sustain us whenever we walk in faith in Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished. That is what the Holy Spirit honors in our life. And God knows how to sustain us whenever we are suffering, whenever we are going through so many things, whenever we're trying to keep up with the call of God on our life, whenever we're trying to do what God wants us to do. And there's literally nothing wrong with doing what God wants you to do. But the realization sometimes, continually realizing, already having a preconceived knowledge that you can't do this in your own strength, learning that further and further, continually realizing that I can't, I can't, I can't do this. God knows that better than you do. And God knows exactly what you need in those seasons of life. The Lord would literally give Elijah rest. The Lord didn't tell Elijah, go flee from Jezebel this time. But even though Elijah did anyways, the Lord understood exactly where Elijah was. And it's not that the Lord just forsook Elijah because he just was overcome with fear. The Lord took care of Elijah when he was in that place of loneliness, when he was in that depressive episode, when he was in that place where he literally thought there was nobody else but him. Um, God knows how to sustain us when we walk in faith in him. The Lord had restored Elijah's body and mind during this time of his life. God did all of it. It was the Lord who met the sacrifice that Elijah offered. It was the Lord who uh, gave Elijah what to prophesy. And here it is literally the Lord personally taking care of Elijah. Under that little juniper tree, God is taking care of his men. And number three, this is my main, this is my third main point. God plus zero is always the majority. There's a popular saying, and I love the sentiment to it, that God, that you plus God is the majority. And that's true. I mean, wherever God is, that's where the majority is at. But even if nobody is on God's side, as Elijah is making things out to be right now in this text, God is still in control. Amen. He still holds the world in the palm of his hand. It's not as though God being uh, omniscient is all-knowing, right? It's not as though God in his omniscience just was blindsided to the fact that Israel would get to the place that they are right now. It's a total pagan, idolatrous land who were so alien to worshiping him. This, I am sure, grieved the heart of God, but it did not catch him by surprise. The Lord knew exactly who Elijah was before Elijah was even born, and he knew what he was going to use Elijah for. He knew that he would have to take care of Elijah. Trials and tribulations just don't catch God by surprise. He knows exactly what he has to do for us. Now, 450 false prophets versus one God-called individual. Focusing on that just for a second. If we had, if we really had the faith that we talk about sometimes, we would look at those statistics and we would probably say, well, the battle's already over if God is involved. But you know what? 450, man, Elijah, what a man of faith. Regardless of where God calls us to be, though, if we keep our trust in where he wants our faith to be, then he will sustain us for the road ahead. You know, uh, (laughs) it's childish, but I did it anyway. Whenever I was uh, younger, like I think I might have been this, I think I had this before I was even saved. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the whole Bible, but in the form of a graphic novel. It's called the Action Bible, and it's just awesome. I still, I mean, I, I gave it away to somebody a few years ago, the one that I first had, and then I saw one at Barnes & Noble, so I grabbed it because, you know, nostalgia. 
And you know what? I don't reference it directly for like actual Bible preaching or teaching, but there are just some times when even today All I'm right. reading the Bible and I can't just picture directly what's happening and I need some assistance. So I'm like, okay, I need some help. And then I just go find this passage in the Action Bible. Right. And it does help. Sometimes it does. The illustrator who worked on the Action Bible for this passage of Scripture uh, in his personally showing uh, what he believed this would have looked like, Elijah uh, being blessed by God in a time of great depression and anxiety. Uh, the way that he illustrates God, he does it very personally. He illustrates God in the form of an actual person sitting beside Elijah under that juniper tree. And the face that he gives, as is referred to here, the angel of the Lord, is oddly similar to how this illustrator would eventually draw Jesus Christ later on in that book. Now, I don't personally believe that that's literally how this happened, but there are many who do uh, cling to the... And I'm very open to it. I'm not against it. The idea that any time the angel of the Lord is mentioned, that it is a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. But that aside the point, as a new covenant believer, there is a great ministry in that image. Yeah. Because you and I yeah. do have faced many times, many trials and tribulations just in the past four years of our lives alone. And we would be lying to ourselves if we said that Christ was not there with us each and every single step of the way, giving yeah. us exactly what we needed, exactly when we needed it, everything. I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful. The power of the blood is just awesome. It's times in those great trials and tribulations where a new covenant believer needs to remind themselves that the blood of Jesus isn't just significant enough for a sinner, but it's significant enough for a Christian. Good. It is Good. significant Good. enough for everybody. It is there to provide me, for me, to comfort me in that time of distress. It is there to be my ever-present help in time of trouble. The blood, the blood, the blood. The Lord takes care of it all. He takes care of you and me. He's going to take care of our adversaries. Ahab and Jezebel were not gods themselves. They were people just like Elijah in, in and of himself. They were people. And, they, and as they came from the earth, they would return to it eventually. And it's not that, I mean, it's just the way that things transpired. Ahab would meet a grisly end and Jezebel gets pushed out of a window I guess so she dies and you know although Jezebel's influence is very well known through especially throughout Jewish history right. whenever John was writing Revelation y'all know this already in chapter 2 verse 20 talking to the church he says I and I paraphrase he says I don't like how you've embraced that woman Jezebel and while I guess you could say there's a slim chance that that's referring to a specific person, just about, and just about meaning every single commentator that I've referenced for that passage from MacArthur to Spurgeon to Geisler to Brother Swagger, they all believe that it's just a pseudonym referring to Jezebel's similar influence that she would have on Ahab concerning demonic influence on the church today. Her influence is that well known. I mean, she is one of the most evil people in the Bible, right. but she cannot stand against the living God of heaven and earth. She brings in an idol who she says is the God of the rain. God sends in a man whose name literally means the Lord is God. And through this man, the Lord says, it's not going to rain until I say so. Yeah. That's who God is. That's exactly who God is. And after this time, we read about how the Lord is not in the fire. He's not in the earthquake. He's not in these great, big, mighty manifestations that the Lord himself brings. But the Lord isn't there to speak to Elijah. But at the end of all of it, in that still, small voice, yeah. the Lord commissions Elijah to go anoint a couple of kings because that's what a prophet does. And then anoint Elisha who will be his replacement. And this chapter ends with Elijah doing just that. Elisha would, um, there's not much I, ha I can say about Elisha specifically, especially since, you know, time I, I went over, but Elijah, a man of great immeasurable faith through great 
uh, disastrous circumstances, it is a story that ministers to us today. Yeah. How even after great success, you can fall to such a low place. It ministers whenever we're going through times of concern or even anxiety ourselves. I think that uh, most of you know that for me personally, uh, that I've accepted an associate pastoral position at a church in Northeast Arkansas. And after I leave Bible college, that is where I'm going to go, uh, at, least in, at least until the Lord tells me to go somewhere else. I literally have no idea how it's going to work out. It could be a total failure for all I know. But the way that things are looking up, it appears that this is where the Lord is leading me to go. And I would be foolish to not pursue the will of God. Amen. It is something that I have expressed great concern about. And I have expressed a little anxiety about it too because it... Uh, <laughs> I haven't done it yet, so I can't tell you what it's like or anything like that. Um, but the Lord reminds me in so many ways that I can be content in Christ. Even if I am failing, I can still be content in Christ, even in the midst of failure. Paul, and it's one of the most popular verses in the New Testament, writing to the church at Philippi, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If Paul can say that from an imprisonment, I can say it from behind a pulpit. And regardless of wherever the Lord calls each of you to be, I understand some of us are staying in Baton Rouge. Some of us are leaving. Um, for all I know, I mean, I don't know. We might never see each other again, but it's our relationship with God that has brought us this far. It's our relationship with God that we have to be trusting in to see us forward. And it's not a matter of whether or not we succeed or whether or not we fail because Christianity really isn't your success story. It's God's success story through you. It's God working through you, God doing all of the heavy lifting, and you just keeping, as Milani says it literally all the time, simple faith yeah. in Jesus Christ and what he has done. And just as quickly as the blood saved your life, the blood is just as aptly able to sustain you throughout this entire Christian life. So that being said... Um, that those are my concluding remarks if you guys can pray with me real quick heavenly father we thank you for this day and lord we bless your name god we don't know anything about tomorrow lord but jesus said not to worry about tomorrow for tomorrow has enough troubles of its own we are to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness and you tell us that all of these things will be added to us god whenever if we ever do find ourselves in these low places as Elijah found himself in in this text. If we ever find ourselves in those places where it seems like the whole world around us is against us, God, bring us to that rest that you brought Elijah to, God. Let us know that you care for us, that you have not forsaken us, God. Yeah. Equip us, God, to further follow after your will for our lives. And God, we ask that you give us the strength going forward that we need, God. Uh, constantly renew our faith, God. Constantly be restoring to us the joy of your salvation. And we'll be sure to give you all of the praise and all of the glory and all of the honor. And we say this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.